Hey, hey, Janina Vela here. So as we have just passed the 49th anniversary of the Declaration of Martial Law, na-realize ko na madami sa atin sa henerasyon natin at kasama ako doon, na kulang ang kaalaman natin tungkol sa kasaysayan. Naniniwala ako na ito ang karapatan at responsibilidad natin para sa akin hindi lang bilang isang influencer or political science student, pero bilang isang mamamayan ng Pilipinas. Kailangan natin pag-aralan ang totoong kwento ng martial law dahil bahagi ito ng ating history. Sana magbibigay ito ng kontribusyon laban sa historical revisionism. I'm not saying na walang oppression or inequalities na nangyari sa ibang termino ng presidente, but we are just going to learn and discuss this period of time. Although we can't make our historical knowledge gap disappear in just one vlog, I believe that we can close it by just an inch. po kayo nung na-declare yung martial law? Third year high school ako. 14 or 15. 21. 17 years old. I was a freshman. I was 14 years old. Katatapos ko lang ng college. 21, 22 yata ako. Naalala niya pa po ba yung September 23, yung proclamation ng martial law? You wake up and then... Biglang nag-shutdown lahat. No radio. Biglang wala ka ng diary. Everything was silent. Yung mga commentators na very bold. Ay, biglang natahimik. No classes. Tapos bawal, bawal magkumpul-kumpulan. Bawal magkwentuhan. Bawal mag-comment. Isa sa mga unang ginawa ni former President Ferdinand Marcos pagkatapos niyang i-declare ang martial law ay i-authorize ang letter of instruction number one. This authorized the military to take over the assets of major media outlets in the Philippines. Ang total ng media outlets na pinasara during martial law ay 464. Eight major English newspapers, 18 vernacular Spanish and English language daily, 60 community newspapers, 66 TV channels, and 20 radio stations and 292 provincial radio stations. Unti-unti, may mga media outlets na pinayagan ulit bumukas. Ang mga dyaryo, kontrolado dahil mayroong sensor. Eh. Um, military yung mga yan. Pero talagang araw-araw nagpupunta sa dyaryo, nakaupo doon. Binabasa yung dyaryo bago lalabas. Lahat monitored. Lahat. Walang freedom. Freedom of speech lalo na. Oh, hindi nga fake news. Uh, Pero limited news. News that's favorable to, to them. Wala, wala na kaming ibang naririnig. Ano po yung understanding nyo ng martial law noon? Noong nabalik ang radyo, ang nadidinig na lang lagi. Sa ikauundad ng bayan, disiplina ang kailangan. Uh, we knew what it would mean. No? The martial law is military rule. So sa akin, ang pagkakaintindi ko sa martial law, Ay yung restrictions, yun ang nakita ko, restrictions on personal behavior. Sinasabi nila may disiplina, may ano, umpisa lang yun, ano, no, ano wala nang disiplina kasi yung mismo military na ang nag-aabuso eh. Uy, maganda ito kasi disiplinado tayo. In the first two years, no, I actually liked it because indeed, tumahimik. And to do all that, you have to instill a climate of fear. And everybody who was against it was... Red tag. You learn to practice self-censorship. Kasi alam mo, you're gonna get in trouble eh. Tapos sasabihin sa amin, pagka tayo nasara, saan naman kukuha ng trabaho yung mga yan? Saan kukuha na ipapakain? So parang may guilty ano pa, ano na pa. So then you practice self-censorship. Nahala si Ferdinand Marcos noong 1965. Nakaupo siya sa Malacanang ng dalawang termino. Pero bago matapos ang pangalawang termino niya, pinirmahan ni Marcos ang Proclamation 1081 noong September 21, 1972. This memorialized September 21, 1972 as the foundation day of the new society o bagong lipunan. He was one of those who provided optimum support to farmers. I think the original agrarian reform program was done under his term. He was a developmental president in the sense that he identified major industrial projects. Nung taong dineclare ang martial law, may potential ang economic growth ng Pilipinas. Ang gross domestic product or GDP natin ay nasa 5.447%. Umakyat ito to 8.92% sa 1973. Kilala si Marcos dahil sa 11 major industrial projects niya. Halimbawa, diesel engine manufacturing, iron and steel mill complexes, cement, phosphatic fertilizers, heavy industry development, and coconut industry rationalization. There were some from society who benefited, and I would say that not only the richest of the rich. You had full-blown 
construction and lot of jobs created. And that sort of created a nascent middle class, okay? Mm -hmm. But that immediately lost eh. Those jobs were gone by the turn of the decade. Oo, ang employment rate natin ay tumaas sa mga early years, pero eventually tumaas rin ang unemployment rate natin from 4.2% to 5.9% from 1978 to 1983. Ang underemployment rate natin ay nag-triple from 10.2% to 29%. Para may comparison kayo, noong October 2020, kahit na sa gitna tayo ng pandemya noon, ang unemployment rate natin ay nasa 8.7% noong October 2020. And that was why, by the end of it all, poverty levels had risen up to higher than they were when martial law was started in 1972. And then what was worse was we had you know, levels of starvation that was not seen at any time in Philippine economic history. Noong 1985, isang taon bago mag-people power revolution, bumagsak ang GDP natin sa negative. Ang wages rin ng mga workers natin ay bumaba. So for unskilled workers in 1965, they were paid about 84 pesos. But in 1986, they were paid only 23. For skilled workers in 1965, they were paid around 112 pesos. But in 1986, they were paid 35 pesos instead. Noong 2015, ang poverty incidence natin ay nasa 21.6%. Noong 1986, ito ay naging 59%. Things got so bad that we had to borrow and we had to cheat the books. No? Nahuli pa nga tayo ng World Bank. Eh. You see, that's the problem. Eh. Oftentimes, when people talk about the glorious days of martial law, they're talking only about the first five years. Eh. At the end of it, I would say development was hugely uneven. The inverted pyramid. Only a few are benefited. The masses are really, sila yung kawawa. Hanggang ngayon, sila pa rin yung naghihikahos, no? So, I don't know. Oh, to some people, of uh, subjectively, that might be paradise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nag-request si Marcos na mag-negotiate ang National Power Company natin with Westinghouse para bumili ng dalawang nuclear reactors. Noon, ang costing ng Westinghouse ay nasa 650 million para sa isang nuclear reactor. Pero bigla ang kontrata natin para sa isang reactor ay nasa 2.2 billion dollars. Pero never rin siyang nagamit. Ano kaya ang nangyari dito? He was pushed to make people sacrifice because he had already lost a lot of loans that were unproductive. He was losing credibility and the bank started to rein in all the borrowing. At the end, what really happened was that he failed us. We were so much in debt. All the industrial enterprises that he planned were not accomplished. He also used those opportunities to steal the money. Noong 1965, $599 million pa lang ang debt natin. In 1986, ang debt natin ay nagbaloon to around $25 billion. This is international debt to the World Bank, IMF, and 483 other commercial banks. ATM yung ano eh, Philippine coffers eh, di ba? Yun ang ginawa nila. Everything that they wanted to buy, the real estate, the paintings, the ano. Everything that they wanted to buy, pinapabayaran sa banko ng Pilipinas. Na-identify ng gobyerno natin ang 860.8 million dollars na ninakaw ng Marcoses. Kaso lang maliit lang to sa estimated 5 to 10 billion dollars total na ninakaw. Fun fact, ito nga ay nasa Guinness Book of World Records para sa greatest robbery of government. Bakit nga po ba na-declare yung martial law? Uh, martial law was declared on the uh, basis of a communist uh, insurgency. The 1970s, the liberal press, in the case of the Philippines, they liked the fact that there was this son of a bitch, their son of a bitch, you know, who was doing and fighting the communists. Everybody was uh, communist influence. Even the church, the schools, the media, the unions, according to them. Nakatulong po ba talaga to sa issue ng communism? Well, it helps because it increased the number of NPAs. <laughs> yes. Yes, may mga analysis na nagsasabi that the imposition of martial law worsened parang mas maraming naging kasapi ang komunista. Actually, hindi yung imposition ng martial law, yung human rights violation nila na patuloy nagwo-worsen 
walang paltos eh, na tuloy-tuloy, no? Yun ang nag-worsen. Isang taon pagkatapos i-declare ni Marcos ang martial law, in-approve niya ang 1973 Constitution. This increased the number of Supreme Court members from 11 to 15 with a single Chief Justice and 14 Associate Justices. We had the uh, theoretically independent judiciary. They, they were open, the courts were open. And who appoints the members of the military commission? Who appoint, who created them in the first place? Who the prosecution? Who approves their decision? It's the same person. Ang presidente lamang ang pwedeng mag-appoint ng justices na to. Kahit walang consent, approval, o recommendation galing sa ibang body o official. Hindi lang ito, pero nag-assume rin siya ng legislative powers kahit may elected legislative body na tayo. The driver of Marcos was appointed judge. Makati. Totoo pala na pwede palang i-control ng isang tao yung ganyan. Kasi talagang may tendency naman ng tao na mag-abuso kung meron siyang power. Martial law does that. It gives the military the power. The economic uh, reforms ought to improve the lives of people. No uh, amount of economic development is worth the sacrificing lives that happened during this regime. And he will be condemned forever for that. Ayon sa historian at politician na si Sir John Dalberg Acton, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Anyway, sana nakatulong itong video na to sa pag-unawa natin sa isang importanting bahagi ng ating history. Again, this is not about comparing presidents or time periods. This is simply about learning about our Philippine history. Because those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Anyway, I will see you in part 2 of this topic and let's all be a little kinder. Bye!